<coughs> right. Um, so I developed for a long time in Java, uh, maybe almost ten years in Java, and um, <coughs> I, I suppose that's uh, up until about five years ago. And after that, I started doing uh, most of the development I did was in Node.js and JavaScript. Uh, the good thing about Java is that you can, you can it, it allows you to write big, massive uh, web applications, right? <coughs> then. Um, the problem with it is uh, writing concurrent applications, so that when it comes to, comes to deal with threads and concurrency, uh, it, gets, um, it gets pretty ropey. Um, the thing about Node, the great thing about Node is that uh, everything runs in one thread, so you don't have any concurrency issues. Uh, it's a great thing about JavaScript in general. <coughs> but the, but the negative about JavaScript is the same thing. You can only, you can only use one thread. <coughs> so, um, the other, the other thing about writing large JavaScript applications is that scaling JavaScript applications to kind of massive enterprise level is incredibly difficult. So because for this reason, because you can't just rely on a single process application getting faster and faster just to increasing um, increasing CPU speed, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, so CPU speeds have pretty much leveled out, and uh, advances in CPU technology are all around parallelization. Uh, multiple cores on one uh, one chip. <coughs> so that and the fact that uh, JavaScript is difficult to, to grow to a large scale mean that a lot of people in the Node community and the JavaScript community uh, started to move towards uh, microservices. So microservices, the idea with microservices is that <coughs> for a lot of reasons you can, uh, you can divide up your application into possibly hundreds of services Little services, maybe a couple of hundred lines of uh, lines of code each. Uh, they might have their own database, each one of them. And the advantage of that is that uh, you you can run as many of those little services as you like, uh, orchestrate all the communication between them, do load balancing, uh, and if you want to upgrade some of the software, you can do it piece piece by piece. Um, so it's a it's a very attractive option, and it also brings other benefits like if you've got multiple teams then you, you're not collaborating on one big monolithic code base. So it's, it's a very attractive option, but the, uh, the difficulty with it is that when you have like 500 small processes, it's, like, it's a bit like babysitting 500 children, you kind of have to, yeah, you have to manage them all. You have, to, you have to keep an eye on them all, even for one developer to know what 500 uh, microservices are and what they do is, is pretty much impossible. So there's a whole other set of challenges that come with microservices. But anyway, I was looking into this and um, <coughs> starting to hear a lot about Erlang, which um, is a language and a, a, an environment that's been around for a very long time. And uh, yeah, so Erlang, Erlang was, uh, it's been around for almost 30 years, since like 86. Uh, Erlang was designed for, by Ericsson for uh, telephone switches, uh, where you've got lots of concurrency. Um, it has to be incredibly reliable and fault tolerant. Um, and a lot of the advances you're seeing now in microservices are the same ideas that evolved actually back in the 80s in Erlang. And it's kind of uh, fueling this uh, revival in, uh, in Erlang. Now Erlang is, a, is a, a language a bit like Java in that it, run, it's, it runs in a virtual machine. It has a bytecode. <coughs> uh, but it's not, it's not the most developer friendly language. It's not the most attractive. And because it's been around for a while, then you know it gets dissed a bit. But uh, like, if you, if you if you make a phone call today, I think there's like a one in three chance that that phone call is being switched through uh, uh, an Erlang uh, bit of software. So it's got a, a very long and um, proven track record in um, managing distributed fault tolerant uh, systems. So th this brings us on to Elixir. So Elixir is another language which uh, is built on the Erlang virtual machine. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so this book came out, and then one of the Ruby core, Ruby on Rails core developers read it. Uh, it goes through seven seven languages and uh, it describes the properties of each of them. It's quite a good book. Um, but this guy, Jose Valim, um, he decided to take some of those ideas and start experimenting with his own language, <coughs> developing in his own language. And he took a lot of ideas from F Sharp, uh, Clojure. Java, Ruby, Haskell, 
and that's when Elixir came out. And it's a very new language because uh, version 1.0 was just released at the end of last year. So the, the properties um, coming from Erlang is that it's, it's, a, it's a functional language. Uh, so you do not deal with shared state uh, like you would in Java. Uh, it's highly concurrent, distributed, fault tolerant, uh, and it's also a very developer friendly language. It's, it's, it's designed to be a lovely language for developers to, to get their teeth into and kind of you know, put a smile on their face. <coughs> now, the next, the next set of slides, because, because of the amount of time I have, I've got a whole set of slides on the, the Elixir language, which I'm going to tap to pretty quickly, I'd say. Uh, the, it, it, most, of the print <coughs> most of the language can be fairly readable, because I want to show an example at the end, which is going to be an, an example application of how you write a, a, a concurrent application <coughs> with a web front end. <coughs> so that's just the basic types. You've got a couple of things that you don't have in other languages, uh, but you know, some languages have tuples. Tuples you'll see quite a lot of. It's basically like, uh, an it's essentially like an array. Um, then you have a list, the list type, which is a linked list. It's a single directional linked list. And then you have other things like atoms, which is like an implicit constant or a symbol. Uh, so you'll see that you'll see those this colon uh, atom. This is something that comes from Erlang, and I think symbol is in closure or something. <coughs> I'll skip over the the basic stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Like one of the I mentioned, Erlang is fairly unattractive. Erlang didn't even have like UTF-8 strings. Um, everything was ASCII. Elixir solves that problem. Has a very nice handling for UTF-8. <coughs> There's the world. But the most, the most fundamental thing to grasp about uh, fu functional languages like this, Erlang and Elixir, is that uh, when you do equals, it's not an assignment. It's more like algebra when you say a equals x plus 2. You're looking for values of a and x, which um, make the equation true. <coughs> now, unlike Erlang, you can reuse variables. So, in, in Erlang, <coughs> if you say x equals 1 and then say x equals 2, it'll fail. Because it says x doesn't equal 2, you've already told me it's equal to 1. Uh, Elixir is a little bit more forgiving, so it allows you to rebind variables so you can actually use it again. Uh, if you want the Erlang type system, you don't want it, uh, you want it to be strictly matched, you just put the hat in front of it. <coughs> yeah, you might have seen it in, in ECMAScript 6 has destructuring. Um, destructuring is very <coughs> common and very powerful in Elixir. So if you have um, maps, <coughs> lists, or in these, these, these examples are all tuples, um, and you match the left side with the right side, it can break out the structure and match the individual um, fields within it. <coughs> uh, pattern matching. Pattern matching is fundamental to almost everything you do in Elixir. Uh, it's also, you know, if, you, if you've looked at Scala, pattern matching is pretty fundamental there as well. Um, so if we have a if we have a list, uh, we do this assignment. Uh, it's going to equate a to one, b to two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> it's, it's doing assignment using destructuring and um, pattern matching in this case. So it's, all, it's just looking for a match where the left equals the right. If if it doesn't <coughs> find a match, it will fail. <coughs> because it's a linked list, uh, taking the head. The first element of the list are, are pushing it on. It's very cheap, so you'll commonly see this. Where you take the top element from your list and match it to head, and the rest of your list uh, is matched to tail. <coughs> and when you're doing functional programming, this is very useful because you don't tend to write code using for loops or while loops. You don't iterate through the uh, code. You tend to execute functions recursively, and with each recursion, you're taking an element off the head of a list. So that that pattern is very popular and common. Okay, I said that already. Uh, variables can't be changed, but they can be rebound in Elixir. <coughs> so this is a function. <coughs> uh, pattern matching in a function. So we're saying we have a function. It can take, um, when the function is executed, you give it one argument. And the argument is matched here. And based on the, there are two patterns here we're matching against. So if the, the, the string coming in is own, it'll match this one and execute this result. 
otherwise it'll match the argument to name and then print the name. So where you see where you might have a lot of if else's in a lot of uh, um, procedural languages, you don't tend to have them here. So uh, this is a Fibonacci example I took from another talk. This is the mathematical definition of the Fibonacci series. And this is the this is an elixir implementation. So it's almost exactly like the mathematical implement, implementation. What you're doing here is you're defining multiple function heads. So if you if you execute it with zero, it gives you zero. If you execute it with one, it gives you one. And if you execute it with anything else, it'll do recursion of n minus one plus n minus the fifth n minus two, which will eventually you start with thirty-two. It'll eventually it'll execute this. Uh, a number of times before finally decrementing back to one and zero. <coughs> yeah, uh, this is uh, using a case statement, which is one of the control flows you have in Elixir. It's just an alternative implementation, but it also uses pattern matching. And pattern matching, because it's a, a virtual machine-based language, uh, and pattern matching is at the core, the pattern matching is highly optimized. So whenever you're doing things like this, it's uh, very performant. It's a kind of performance you don't get in some of the other uh, kind of Erlang-like systems that have evolved which on top of, say, the Java virtual machine, because uh, the virtual machine doesn't have inherently the support uh, inside it for uh, pattern matching. Um, there's a nice example here of how you how you can do like a compression using one length encoding of a list like this, so that you you, you repetitions are are converted into tuples of the number and the number of occurrences of it uh, using um, so, uh, three function heads for the same thing and just using this processing. I'll skip over it now, but uh, it's, it's a nice one to look at. Um, and I'll leave the link up at the end. So for um, control flow, you saw con already. Uh, you do have if and unless, but you, which is just not if. Um, but uh, if, if is quite infrequently used, and then you have case, which is different than you would have seen in other languages like Java and JavaScript uh, with a switch statement. It's, a, it's just a, a control flow that allows you to pattern match on a single input. So then, um, yeah, so pattern matching is the main thing to get about Elixir, I think, uh, if you haven't come across pattern matching in, in other languages. Uh, in terms of the data types then, it's got a number of associative data types. One is a key keyword list, um, which is, can be used for an associative array. Um, it allows duplicates, but it's generally for small lists of uh, small lists. There's also a map, which is uh, more suitable for larger sets, and um, it allows um, um, it's it's unordered and uh, it doesn't it doesn't allow duplicates. But you can use both of these with pattern matching. So you can actually destructure parts of these things and use them in your, in your function definitions. Uh, and it just eliminates the amount of code you would normally write to figure where you're getting a value and doing a comparison and then even if statement else, etc. You can do a lot of things with one simple match, uh, which, is, um, which, is, which is very nice and very much uh, pro productivity. Uh, you have struct as well, which is a, just a, a kind of a, a wrapper around maps, which allows you to define a, a basic data type. And it doesn't like it's 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 not an object-oriented language, right? So uh, it's um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's m a little bit more like uh, the original object-oriented definition, like with actors. Um, <coughs> but it does have it does have facilities to do polymorphism. So in this case. You can define a protocol, which is um, somewhat akin to like a Java interface, um, and then you can you can define an implementation of say Stringify, and then you can apply it to any existing module. So, um, yeah, this is one of the, really, the nicest features I like about it. <laughs> in, in most most languages, you, you have this kind of um, construct, where if you're executing nested functions. Um, you put them inside each other, you know, and this one, this one just has two levels of parentheses. You've probably seen ten. Uh, so the, and when you do see ten, then you're like trying to find the first one, and you have to read it from the inside out, right? Um, 
to figure out the order of the things. Because like the name, then I'll go get user, and then I'll go get user name. So it takes uh, one of the constructs from F sharp, I think. Uh, I, I, I don't know what it's actually officially called, but people call it pipe forward. And it allows you to execute things in the right order. So you say, take the value of main, pipe it in as the first argument to get user, and pipe the output of that into the first argument of is it min. So it's a nice <coughs> left to right arrow no notation. Um, yeah, it's got lots of nice helper classes for dealing with lists and innumerables, which are like um, uh, iterations on collections. Uh, like for example, this is just um, executing a function on every um, Yeah, it's just executing a function on an array. This is using a range. <coughs> and then it's got lots of functions like you find in, say, if you're a JavaScript developer in like low dash or underscore um, for doing um, iterations and maps. So th the reason those are quite useful and the reason there's uh, those uh, modules are actually quite large is because otherwise you'll end up writing a lot of your own hand rolled recursion uh, in like the examples I just saw and this is it's also got the concept of streams so if you're if you're piping uh, say this uh, range of one to a million uh, through to uh, an enum function it's going to build up intermediate uh, collections each step if you use stream it's basically doing it on demand so it's a lot more performant and uh, memory efficient um, yeah, for comprehensions, there's another way of processing lists um, or innumerables. So it, it allows you to take uh, data from one um, data structure, uh, do some filtering on it, uh, apply a function to it, and then put it into a completely different data structure. Uh, again, something you, you might do in 10 to 100 lines of code in other languages, uh, you can do in kind of one here. Now, the, the language itself is quite nice. Uh, but <coughs> it's um, that's the syntactic sugar, really, I suppose. And then uh, th the rest of it comes down to uh, a lot of the features that Erlang bring to it, a lot of the stable, long, proven uh, features. So um, <coughs> to understand that, you, would, you just need to understand about processes. And processes in Erlang are not like uh, threads, and they're not like operating system processes. These are processes within the Erlang virtual machine which are incredibly lightweight. So um, I can show an example, when I run the example later, I might be able to show um, actually the, the inspector, which will show us exactly how much RAM you can use. But I, I'll show a basic process, a very simple process, but it'll use like less than a kilobyte of RAM. That's its heap. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not unusual to create like 100,000 processes in your application. So, you would you, you could create a process where in another system you might create a service, you might create a process where in another system you might just create a class, um, and that's generally how you build up your Elixir applications, like creating processes and having each process send pass messages to the other process. So in this case, in this line here, we're spawning a new process to execute function two by two. Um, that's it. So it's going to spawn the process, execute it and exit. So the process has died already. Um, and this is how you send messages. So you're sending, you send uh, a message with, uh, so it's using a tuple to identify the message and then a string for the value. And this is how you, uh, this is how you receive the message. You do, you're just doing pattern matching here again, like we saw. <coughs> so it's a uh, it's, it's fairly simple construct. What, receive it, what that's actually doing is every process has its own mailbox and that's a, an ordered list of your messages and when you do receive it's, it's popping a message off that list. Okay, so this is uh, spawning a process and sending to it. We'll see a bit more like that later so I don't have to spend much time with this. Listening. Yeah, so this is like uh, you're creating a process, and all it does is raise. It's like raising an, raising an exception. So this is going to raise an exception already, because we, we we chose spawn link rather than spawn. That means that this child process is going to be linked to us. So when it dies, we want to die too. Um, 
And this is this the, all the different ways of doing this in Erlang or Elixir can become very fundamental to how you do fault tolerance. Because the principle in, in these systems is that you want to fail fast. So you don't want a lot of exception handling. Um, the whole point of it is that you've got lightweight processes which when they fail, they die and you've got some sort of supervisor or some monitor which is going to detect that and quickly replace it with a new one. And, and that's, that's the way of thinking. So you, you don't uh, kind of pollute your code with lots of exception handling and error handling. Uh, you tend to code for the happy path. You let it fail and when it fails, you restart. That's the model. Okay, so then uh, in Elixir, uh, you, you, it gives you a lot of um, modules which are essentially utility modules to, to aid you with all of this. So you don't, you, you don't have to do spawn and um, send and receive every time. You don't have to hand roll your own servers and your receivers and um, modules for handling state. It's got a lot of um, modules which handle that for you. So task is one. If you were to hand roll a module which created a process, uh, which represented a process which was going to store state. So in, in, the, in a functional language, you don't have, you don't have state, right? You've, um, I mean, you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't store variables within your module. You can't do that. You don't have like fields and members. Um, so the, the way it's done is uh, typically something like this. We've got this module state holder, which starts a process with this iterate function. And this iterate function, for, in its argument, takes its state. <coughs> so every time it receives something, it's performing an action and updating its state, <coughs> or, or not. And then it's iterating itself. So it's just a loop uh, that keeps on going, and it's the, essentially the state is just held then in the stack. So in this case, it's, it's just a simple key value store. <coughs> um, and the, the initial value is an, an empty map. So it gets an empty map. If you do a put on it, then it's going to uh, put puts the key value into the map and then iterates again with that, um, with that map. And that's how state is, is typically stored. Agent is one of the wrapper classes that just simplifies that for you. Uh, yeah, a nice in interesting thing and an interesting way of seeing how processes work in Elixir is if you start doing stuff with I.O., like uh, the console or a file. Um, so if you open a file, you'll end up with a file handle. And if you look at that file handle, it's actually a process identifier. So that means that it, it, there's actually a process which is responsible for reading and writing that file you've opened. And when you perform operations like writing bytes to that file, it's sending those to another process, and that process is writing to the file. Yeah, the documentation is nice because it allows you to write uh, markdown documentation in it, which is nicer than Java doc, I think. Um, okay, so then uh, when you actually want to create a proper application, the, the, the ecosystem around um, Elixir, there's, there's quite a nice set of tools for it. So Mix is the, um, the build tool. So this is how you create a new app, and it basically has the generator set up it will create the, the scaffolding for you um, with a, a default class, a default test, etc. Um, yeah, so, so that's what you end up with. It will create a, a nice empty module for you. Uh, the unit testing framework is very nice because it, um, it's, uh, it, it, uses, it uses some of the, some other language features to be able to give you a little bit more detail. Of, um, when this assertion fails, it won't just tell you it'll fail. It'll tell you what the value on the left was and what the value on the right was. Um, you know, you don't get that with other languages, but because of the way uh, Elixir implements this stuff, it works. Like when, when you do a search here, this is actually, um, it's not part of the language, it's not part of a library. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a macro. So the other thing I didn't mention yet about uh, the benefits of Elixir is that it supports metaprogramming. So you can, you can make modifications to the language and um, write nice things like this, um, which, uh, yeah, where you can actually parse the code that's being <coughs> passed into the, passed into that um, keyword. So OTP then is the, the massive um, framework that underlies all of the processing and concurrency stuff in Elixir. 
uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite a big topic, so I'm just going to show a few examples of it. And, all that. and this is an example of a micro. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, there's a book on it. Like it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not something you recommend it to do. It is nice that you can do it, but generally you're encouraged not to try and go crazy creating your own DSL within the language. Uh, but there are quite an, a, a, a nice few examples of it already. So, uh, we did. So, yeah, yeah. There's another example. So this is like link in um, in .NET, but it's using macros, so you can write uh, queries in the Ecto, which is like the the database uh, library, database access library. You're writing queries queries in quite a nice um, natural way. So Phoenix, yeah, Phoenix is. I suppose if you look at a lot of the frameworks that have emerged from Ruby on Rails and how it did things, Phoenix is kind of another generation of that. Uh, one of the, the nice things about it, though, is the fact that it supports channels, which are like, um, well, it, it can use web sockets or other means, but it's essentially real-time uh, data. So um, this is a, an example of how, all you have to do really to create a basically simple, a simple CRUD app using Phoenix generators. Uh, this will build your HTML, your, um, your model, your Ecto stuff, all the stuff you need to access your database and do CRUD uh, operations on it. So for the concurrent example I have, in the three minutes I have, uh, I chose uh, Conway's Game of Life. Uh, yeah, it's like cellular automation, uh, automation, it's like a 40-year-old uh, mathematics uh, idea, but uh, if you haven't seen it already, it's basically, you've got uh, a grid of cells, and each one has rules about how it survives, how, what conditions it dies under, and what conditions it will um, uh, reproduce under. So cells die uh, if they're too overcrowded, if there are too few neighbors, or and if, if it has just the right number of neighbors, it'll, the cells will actually reproduce and create a new, a new cell. And it's, 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 it's a simple enough algorithm to implement in procedural language. The way I chose to do it here was using a Phoenix. I just created a Phoenix app, and then I created a couple of more uh, modules. There's not a lot of code to it, but the, the point of this was to show what it would be like if every cell in your grid was implemented as its own process. So um, this is like the machine class, which is uh, its process of its own right. It, um, it creates a world of cells, so I'm going to create 50 by 50 grid. And that's going to be 2,500 cells in the grid then, so 2,500 processes. And then the cells are going to, they're aware of their neighbors. So when cells are, are created initially, we tell it what all its neighbors are. And every time a cell changes state, it tells its neighbors. And that's what drives the, the whole process. So I can just, uh, let's see. So this is using Mix to run the Phoenix application. What? Oh man. Ah, I'm running it somewhere else. Ready. Okay. So let's rerun it here. So when it starts, it's just going to randomly populate the world with uh, approximately two thirds of the cells will be alive. And then we should be able to look at it here. Yeah. So this is basically uh, every time a cell changes state, it's uh, sending a message up to the machine, so to its parents that spawned it. And that machine is then, it's, it's fairly crude in that every time, uh, every time a child cell changes state, it's sending a message up through the Phoenix channel, which is basically sending a WebSocket message up to um, up to the browser, and then we've got like uh, I can just it's worthwhile <laughs> probably seeing the JavaScript for this. Yeah, so that's that's the web application. So Phoenix comes with uh, the channels library comes with the Java, JavaScript uh, library. So this is us. Uh, <coughs> 
joining uh, joining the channel, and then on we, every time we get a, an event, go to state on this topic, and uh, then we're just doing a draw operation. So that payload that we're sending up from each of our cells is just the x y and whether it's alive or not. And it, it, the difference, I suppose, with uh, a lot of other implementations is that we don't get to see the initial state. We just every time we we, we open the browser. I mean, you, you could all, if you're on a network here, you could all connect into this and you all monitor the, the same state over this channel infrastructure. It's like a pub, basically a pub sub system, so everybody who joins gets its own, uh, is its own subscriber. But yeah, we don't see the initial state, so we just see the cells that are changing. So the gray ones are the ones we don't know about yet. No, they never told us their state, probably because they're, they're not too healthy. But as, as, as it evolves, um, yeah, um, as it evolves, you know, you, you'll end up filling up most of the space. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, there, I mean, the, the more, a more practical application for this is stuff like chat applications, bulletin boards, uh, anything else where you have push notifications from your system. Uh, like one of, the, one of the recent success stories around Erlang was is WhatsApp. With WhatsApp, um, they put in, in a, a blog post a year or so ago, maybe, that they'd, uh, they'd scale. Like, that was a small, a small team of like 20 something people, I think. Uh, they chose Erlang, they chose FreeBSD to run their systems on, and they were able to scale to a million concurrent connections uh, using Erlang FreeBSD. And they then uh, since reached uh, 2 million concurrent connections on a single machine. Um, and it, with that, that's the kind of idea that like you can have a process for every connection you have and service each user individually and have the full tolerance in there around something you don't, you, you can typically achieve with other languages. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions for all? Do you have your slides online now? I do, yeah, actually, <laughs> it's in, yeah, there's a link. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tweet them on the Cork Dev. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I just have a question. Um, the syntax of Erlang and Elixir, um, does it differ? Have, have they, like Elixir, they've improved the syntax to become more modern, so there's a kind of, I suppose, like 1980s feel. Yeah. Not really what they've done. Like, does it differ? Like, it's, is it quite different, or? Um, you know, I'd say if you're if you're familiar with Erlang, it's, it's probably quite easy to get into Elixir because you can do it, it's it's not that similar. It's it's similar. Like in, in Erlang, has some funny things. Like if a, if something has a like we saw the atoms in Elixir or colon, the atom name, in um, in Erlang, everything with a lowercase letter starts with a lowercase letter is an atom. If you want a variable, it has to start with an uppercase letter. Uh, every line of code in Erl Erlang has to end with a full stop. It's, and you know, the Erlang language designers thought that was excellent because it was like English, it was like an English sentence. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it, there's a couple of things in it. Uh, there's a few simple uh, things that just, uh, that make it, yeah, way more productive to, uh, than, than Erlang, way more attractive. Yeah. How hard is it to go from the to uh, functional, if you're just writing a standard application that's not a chat app? Um, no, it's not. It's not too bad. I, I think like when I was looking into it first, I just started on like um, doing some of the Euler project examples, you know, uh, which are just you know some basic problems trying to implement them in Linux. And it, you know, it's a bit of a twist in your brain to um, you know kind of reprogram it a little bit uh, from imperative programming. But you know, if you if you've done say JavaScript, which is has like Things like uh, closures um, uh, or any other language like that, it makes it easier. But during the the actual functional recursive stuff, it just it's just I'd say a case of a few days of uh, <laughs> eating your head off your desk, and then uh, it's uh, it's not too bad. Yeah, it's like anything, time gets easier. But it, it's it, it's kind of rewarding when you get it right as well, uh, because it is you do find that you can implement. Fairly complex stuff with just a few lines of code that way. Look, man, no loops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no side effects. So. Uh, just a question. Um, so I didn't see in your kind of good examples, you don't import anything. So are modules like globals? 
um, in Elixir, or do you need, like if you define a module, do you need to import it elsewhere? Yeah, you do. <coughs> so in, the, in that case, um, all my modules were in the same in the same project and the same namespace, so I didn't have to do any of that. But you can you can you can just use dot notation essentially to do like package type, and then you can use the the use uh, yeah use use uh, uh, keyword, and you can also you can also import like just a few a couple of a selective functions from the module and stuff like that. So like if, if you're doing a Phoenix application, you'll, you'll be importing uh, mo modules and functions from so Phoenix. So like with importing functions, can you do like um, like mixing composition and stuff like that? Or uh, it not really. Um, not really. You'd be like essentially you'd be implementing delegation in that case. Like if I was writing a, c a controller in Phoenix, yeah. Um, like what do I like? What do I bring in? What does um, or what do I inherit from something? Or do I? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Except essentially, yeah. That's what you're doing. Sorry, the use keyword is for inheritance. It's, okay. it's like inheritance. So you're bringing in that module's functionality. Mm -hmm. The import is actually just for importing a module for use. Okay. Uh, yeah, for execution. But there isn't uh, multiple inheritance. It's single. Inheritance. No, no, no. It's not. It's not object oriented. So you're not yeah, yeah, doing no, inheritance. No. Yeah. You're just bringing in that module. Okay. 